Hi there and welcome back to Extinctions. This is video number four and in this video we're going to be looking at an overview of the big five mass extinctions from the Phanerozoic. So the period of time where we have uh, complex animal fossils and plant fossils to help us understand some of these events. So let's start at the beginning of those five with the end of the Ordovician period. So We'll be looking at each of the five in turn, what fauna, what animals they impacted, and the possible causes of each extinction. So the end order vision, mass extinction, that's our first one, occurred about 445 million years ago. There were substantial turnovers among marine animals. There was probably some life on land at this point, but there isn't any fossil record of that, give or take, and so that makes it harder to say what occurred on land. Um, the extinction itself, it's most reef building animals. Uh, two thirds of all brachiopod and bryozoan families went extinct. Uh, lots of families of echinoderms, ostracods and trilobites also died out. So um, it had a, <clears throat> a significant impact across many different groups of animals. A possible cause of this extinction is the paleogeography of the time, especially that of a large southern continent called Gondwana. At this time in Earth history, there were a bunch of um, small continents floating up around the north of the globe and around the equator, um, actually mostly around the equator, um, which were um, colliding with each other and there were mountain building events going on. But there was a big southern continent called Gondwana um, that was happily sitting around towards the southern um, part of the globe. So during the Ordovician, we can identify that there were tropical type reefs and the associated rich fauna we, we kind of associate with um, tropical reefs today were um, parallels were um, present around the shores of North America and Europe and other land masses that at that point were, as I've said, largely around the equator. As the um, period progressed though, the southern continents drifted over the South Pole. Ultimately, this caused a severe and relatively sudden glaciation called the Hernantian Glacial Maximum, uh, which is shown on this uh, diagram of the events that happened towards the latest Ordovician and the start of the Silurian. Ordovician ends here, Silurian starts here. And you can see that there was a major glaciation that kicked off towards the end of the Devonian that was followed by an oceanic anoxic event. So what we think happened is that when this glaciation had kicked off, ice spread north in all directions. It cooled the southern oceans, locking water into the ice and then lowering the sea levels globally. This meant that polar faunas that had been at high latitudes um, moved towards the tropics and as a result, many warm water faunas died out. So this whole tropical belt, which had been um, responsible for much of the diversity, at least of life in the fossil record, um, just disappeared entirely as a result of these changing climates. So that's the late Ordovician event. The next and our second of the big five mass extinctions occurred, occurred at, during the late Devonian period. This appears to have been a succession of extinction pulses that lasted from about 380 to about 360 million years ago. The end of Vonian is actually preceded by another event, and some have suggested that this entire um, period is a rather drawn out series of extinctions, but not a clear cut mass extinction. So it could be just a series of smaller extinction events. Either way, I suppose that's largely semantic, a load of things died. Um, it affected both the marine and land-based, so terrestrial ecosystems, at slightly different times within a relatively short time span of 100 to 300,000 years. Um, in terms of the organisms that were nastily uh, impacted or impacted badly, that included abundant free-swimming cephalopods. Some examples of such things are shown on this slide. These are ammonoids. Many of those went extinct as were the extraordinary armoured fishes of the Devonian, shown on the right-hand side here. There was this diversity of fairly weird forms that didn't make it through this extinction. We can identify um, substantial losses in both groups of coral that were around at this time, both those that, that's the rugus and the tabulate corals, if you 
are familiar with those two. Um, and we see significant losses in the brachiopods, the crinoids, that's a form, form of echinoderm, ostracods, um, so those are uh, crustacean microfossils, and the trilobites, these um, marine arthropods that are now, now fully extinct. Those took a bit of a hit at the end of the late Devonian. They didn't go extinct, finally, at this point. The causes of the end Devonian extinction are debated we know that there was a hypoxic or anoxic phase in the oceans and that was accompanied by a global carbonate crisis so we had a low oxygen that was difficult to make carbonates we also know there were isolated and short-lived plunges from global greenhouse um, conditions so nice warm conditions into ice house conditions um, that followed these black shale deposits associated with that hypoxic event um, but we don't really know what caused this, and that's our proximal killer. Our ultimate killer remains a matter of debate, um, and indeed it's a very complex event, this one. Um, the paper that I've put on here, under C for more, um, which is Kaiser et al. 2016, I think provides a good overview. Some of the suggested culprits include potential volcanism or extraterrestrial impactors, but I, I didn't feel strongly um, convinced either way to put either of those as the factor that caused it on this slide at least but then there is more reading you can do if you want to learn all about it so that brings us to the biggest of all of these events that's the permo-triassic extinction sometimes called the great dying that sounded kind of catty it wasn't meant to it's a fairly metal name but there you go um the great dying uh so as part of this event, we said goodbye to the trilobites, um, cool creatures that um, are no longer with us called the Eurypterids. These are otherwise known as the sea scorpions. Um, a bunch of important echinoderm groups, uh, an example of those, uh, the, an example of an echinoderm group that went extinct at this point is the blastoids. Tabulate and rugose corals also bought it completely. And then uh, after this event, sclerotinian corals, those are the kind of corals that we still have around today, um, evolved relatively relatively quickly after this event. But, I mean, me picking out on those things that um, completely uh, disappeared uh, overlooks the fact that this, this event affected every major marine invertebrate group. Um, it effect, impacted on the land-based terrestrial so land-based, sorry, terrestrial, amphibians and reptiles. This is the only mass extinction to have really um, had any impact on the insects whatsoever. There were a load of insect orders that died out as part of this. So really, it's quite a significant event. In short, the Permatriassic saw the virtual annihilation of life. Somewhere between 4 and 20% of all species survived the event. If we look at rocks crossing the Permo-Triassic boundary in high resolution, we can see that actually this event had a series of pulses. This is what the image on the left-hand side of this slide is showing you. That figure is a close-up look at the end Permian mass extinction from a sequence of rocks in China that actually crosses this extinction event. Um, and this is the pattern of extinction of 333 species of marine animals through 90 meters of sediment spanning the um, PT boundary. So the ages are from a radiomet radiometric dating and carbon isotopes. And you can see that marked on this diagram, we have three extinction levels, which are labeled A, B, and then C. Each one of these vertical lines records the stratigraphic range of one of these marine species. So the range that we find these fossils. So bear in mind that um, they, they were last found um, at whichever level they're marked on here. That doesn't necessarily they meant they went extinct at that precise moment. There could have been a localized extinction, but nevertheless, it's a good indicator when we're looking at this, of what events were happening. So on the basis of this particular study, we can say that um, event B that's marked on here is where the huge catastrophe occurred. Um, many, many species went extinct within a very short time period on the line marked B here. Some 
species did survive, see all of these ones that are going up there, Fubi, only to be killed off at Extinction Pulse C. So that's interesting. That's telling us something about the kind of fine detail of what's actually happened in this event. There were a series of pulses of extinction. On the right, you can see some block diagrams showing a typical um, seabed in China at the very end of the Permian period. Um, so this shows us a rich set of reef ecosystems with dozens of sessile and mobile mobile bottom dwelling species and a load of plank planktonic or nectonic species, those living in the water com column, such as fishes and ammonites. Then immediately after the crisis that's shown on the bottom here, you can see what ha has actually happened to this ecosystem. This rich ecosystem has been reduced to only two or three species of bivalves and an inarticulated brachiopod, a thing called lingula. These are our disaster taxa. So over this relatively short time period, there's a massive change in the makeup of ocean communities. And the sediments associated with this event above it become black shales with few to no fossils and no burrows. So this is um, more good evidence that life was really struggling. Um, the fact they're black implies anoxia, so there's not much oxygen around, supported by um, the presence of a mineral called pyrite in these rocks. The suddenness and the magnitude then of this mass extinction suggests some kind of dramatic cause. So the obvious things we could be calling up upon to explain this are a impactor or volcanism. So there is the evidence for uh, a meteorite impact at the PT boundary has been reported. Um, it comes in the form of a special form of quartz called shocked quartz that um, the argument is only forms during impact events. Um, reported extraterrestrial noble gases have been trapped in carbon compounds um, and a number of other lines of evidence have been used to support this idea that there was an impactor at this particular event. It must be said though, proposals of impact have not gained widespread support. This is mainly because the evidence seems much weaker than the evidence for an impactor in the KPG impact event, the one that killed off the dinosaurs a bit later. So you may be able to hear an ambulance or police car going past outside. Um, so I'll let that pass, cool. So, in terms of explaining the um, PT extinction, attention has focused in recent years on the Siberian traps. These are some rock deposits that are shown on this slide here. Indeed, I say some rock deposits. These are extrusive, so um, outside the earth, um, igneous deposits outside the earth. In igneous rocks, if you're not a geologist, there's a difference between intrusive and extrusive rocks. Uh, extrusive is on, on the surface of the planet, so that means that these were erupted onto the surface of the Earth, and I, I say they were erupted on the surface of the Earth. Two million cubic kilometers of basalt that cover 1.6 million square kilometers were erupted into an area that is now in eastern Russia and buried the land surface under a depth of between 400 meters and three kilometers of an, a fine-grained igneous rock called basalt. So this isn't really just a minor eruption. This is a really major event that had massive impacts on the Earth at the time. And indeed, I think it's fair to say that it is now widely accept, uh, accepted that these massive eruptions, which were confined to a time span of less than one million years in total, were a significant factor in the PT extinction. If you want to know how, recent work has suggested that the initial global warming um, that resulted from these um, eruptions reached levels of between 8 and 11 degrees centigrade. Um, that would result from volcanic emissions. Volcanoes love to churn out greenhouse gases as well as churning out lava. And that um, raise in temperature would have triggered the release of large amounts of methane from permafrost and shelf sediments, which is, uh, so methane is stored in these sediments in the form of methane hydrates that become unstable at higher temperatures. Methane is a really hardcore greenhouse gas, and so the release of those may have led to more warming and the outcomes that we've just learned about. Lots and lots of things died. 
So that's the PT extinction. I would highlight that because this is the biggest, it's a very active research field and there's a lot of reading out there if you'd like to, to learn more about it. So let's move onwards. Let's look at the marine mass extinction event that occurred at or close to the Triassic Jurassic boundary, so about 200 million years ago. This has long been recognized by the loss of many, in fact, most ammonoids. So those are those free swimming cephalopods I showed you um, when we were talking about the Devonian. Many families of brachiopods, bivalves, gastropods, and marine reptiles also took a hit. And this um, extinction event marked the final demise of some, um, some vertebrate-like creatures called conodonts, which form really useful microfossils that we know from their, their mouth parts, their teeth, essentially. And so those went extinct at the PT, uh, PT sorry, the, the Triassic, Jurassic, Triassic Jurassic boundary. So the evidence in this um, particular extinction event points to anoxia and then global warming following massive flood basalt eruptions that were located in the middle of the supercontinent Pangaea um, as the North Atlantic was beginning to form. So you've got this situation where you've got a supercontinent that is starting to just have hints of ripping apart um, and associated with those um, that, that rift that's forming is a thing called CAMP, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. I've put a paper about this on the slide if you want to learn more about it. So a recent slew of work has used evidence from, uh, the, uh, min from the mineral, from, from the element mercury, so geochemistry, to dig down into a bit more detail about how this um, extinction may have proceeded. This image um, on the slide shows a nice figure from the uh, Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, uh, drawing together lots of evidence from different sites using different proxies for what was going on during this time period. It shows that there was a definite correlation between biotic events and this camp. But remember, correlation does not equal to causation. And indeed, some authors believe it's possible that the end Triassic event is not a clear-cut mass extinction. It may have been uh, more than one phase, and it could have been equally about lowered origi origination rates of species compared to the sudden extinction of major groups. So something was going on, but actually tying this one down beyond the, uh, the correlated association with the camp, which you can see kicking off here, is very difficult to do. So let's finish by looking at potentially the most famous of our big uh, five mass extinctions. This is the um, end Cretaceous or KPG, so Cretaceous Paleogene uh, extinction event. It's widely researched, um, uh, possibly because it's relatively recent and it's a bit easier to dig down into what happened. So we know a lot about this, but also because um, iconic organisms were killed by this particular extinction event, including the non-avian dinosaurs, the swimming reptiles, the pterosaurs, the last remaining ammonites, um, so a group of bivalves called the rudists, and a group of um, cephalopods related to squid and um, octopodes called the belenoids, all of those bought it. Uh, this mass extinction and those are really quite iconic animals so i think there's probably a focus of research on it because of that as well we also see um, uh, across the kpg extinction event a sudden loss of angiosperm taxa and their replacement by ferns so the angiosperms are the flowering plants but then a progressive return after this event towards normal floras on land so the explanation for this event was first properly floated in 1980 in a paper by Science by Louis Alvarez and his colleagues. This made what was at the time a very bold assertion that a 10 kilometer meteorite had hit the earth at the um, KPG. This was based on reports of an unusual clay band that was found right at the KPG boundary um, within a succession of marine limestones. And the authors had done a chemical analysis on this band in which they identified a spike in the metallic element 
iridium. So this is shown on the left hand side here. You can see iridium abundance happily going do -do 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 up to the KPG, then <whistles> big excursion, um, very high iridium layer levels at the event and then lower levels above that point. And we can see a similar, um, so it, or similar, a coincident um, decrease in the number of spores and um, angiosperm pollen we see in the rocks around this time. So this is showing the biological impact that's tied to this iridium spike. So what has happened with this spike is that we've gone from normal background levels of 0.1 to 0.3 parts per billion of iridium in the rock to about nine parts per billion. Iridium is a platinum group metal that's very rare on the Earth's crust. It reaches Earth almost exclusively from space in the form of meteorites or micrometeorites. So the background low levels we're seeing most of the time here represent the result of numerous minor meteorite impacts or micrometeor impacts that just go on all the time. They're happening all the time. Things are falling in from space. Thus, it seems likely that the uh, spike that we're seeing here reflects an impactor. So uh, this is a uh, impactor from outer space. At first, this was um, controversial, and in no small part, that cause, was because Alvarez is a physicist, and there were lots of people who actually studied this extinction who were essentially saying, well, we've studied this for years and we've not noticed, is an impression I get from the literature. But in 1991, a crater was identified in, at Chicxulub in Mexico. So this is a, a crater that is in, found in Upper Cretaceous sediments on the Yucatan Peninsula. Peninsula. So you can see it on a map here, here's the crater. And here we've got lots and lots of evidence for large waves, which we would expect to be associated with a major bolide impact such as this. So what we now believe happened is that this impact threw up a huge cloud of dust that encircled the globe, blacked out the sun, and that caused extinction worldwide by stopping photosynthesis in land plants and phytoplankton. Um, those are the primary producers of um, our ecosystems. And when they died out, the food for the herbivores had gone. The herbivores died out, followed by the carnivores. So that sequence of events is relatively well supported. There is still minimal argument going on though, because also at this time we have a, a series of, um, again, basaltic extrusive igneous rocks called the Deccan Traps that were extruding. This is a vast outpouring of lava, lava that occurred over the two to three million years span, spanning the KT boundary. Um, nowadays, these rocks are found in India. So they could have had an impact as well. And the only argument really that's going on I get the impression in terms of the KPG is the relative impact of those two. And most um, papers are swinging towards the impact of having a far more significant um, kind of causal uh, relationship to the extinction than the Deccan traps do. But just bear in mind that that argument continues to bubble along a little bit. And that, with a lot of talking, brings us to the end of our five big mass extinctions.